Dziękuję bardzo oraz dziękuję kolegom za stworzenie takiego perfektnego kontekstu do tego, o czym teraz będę mówić, ponieważ e, będzie to zdecydowanie ciekawie dla Joakima, ponieważ jesteśmy jednym z tych muzeów, który właśnie idzie stopień za stopniem tą metodologią, o którą mówił, ale teraz jesteśmy na stronie e, Sebastiana z wystąpieniem poza e, granice muzealne, tradycyjne i robimy coś raczej skierowane na szerszą audytorię, o czym zaraz spróbuję opowieść. Więc um, przepraszam, ale przełączę się w język angielski, <głos> ponieważ łatwiej mi będzie szukanie słów, ale w komunikacji, jeżeli ktoś by chciał porozmawiać do, głębiej o tych tematach, które tutaj przedstawię, to zdecydowanie w jakimkolwiek zastępnym języku. Um, Say, I will try to squeeze into 15 minutes. It's going to be quite challenging. So I will probably prioritize those bites where I would go to uh, showcase some very practical experiences of our cultural productions as a museum, as a research institution, but also giving a glaze of the methodology because we probably, and I'm quite sad to realize that I'm the only voice from Ukraine today. In our program, we had the other two colleagues, but they didn't manage to get permission to leave the country. And I would like to remind all of us that this is a reality we all live today. And because when we are looking for a tone of voice and when we are looking for specific language, how to talk and speak about war, Uh, we are we finding ourselves in a very different situation because we can't anymore work in a methodology of oral history, but it's rather documenting. We are documenting what is going on right now and trying not to exclude, obviously, the uh, historical context, but build our foundation on that. There's a huge work to be done. And I'm serving as a head of information and education sector and curator, uh, mostly uh, dedicated to the traumatic experiences, exhibitions, and based on our topic of our museum, you understand that most of our ex uh, exhibitions are dedicated to traumatic experiences. And I would love to run you through the intricate process of creating participant journey within exhibitions centered on traumatic events with a specific focus on aesthetic and attic foundations. Uh, that discourse that you, I've introduced three different projects I would love to touch today. It's a lost childhood and yeah, I will focus most on this one. As you can see a kid on the left side. Wounded culture, it's our documenting um, project we started back in 2022nd and very controversial and very interesting project of decolonizing um, totalitarian uh, sculpture and monuments that was a project the garden you can see with the uh, on the third picture um, first a few words about us we are a memorial museum of totalitarian regimes called territory of terror and we are placed at the territory of former ghetto This is a very uh, sad and very uh, difficult and challenging historical place in Lviv because about 30,000 of Jewish people just get into their very last journey from that place in Lviv. And also transit prison number 25. And I'm sad to confess, but it speaks volume that only after years of working in the museum, I learned that my own grandma was... Uh, held in this prison for a couple of weeks as a teenager. She never ever spoke about that until her death. I only learned that afterwards. And this probably gives you quite important context about the historical reality and cultural experience and the culture of memory we have in Ukraine. A couple of times here that was mentioned that we have quite similar issues but very different culture of memory. And this is quite important moment to take into account each time when we are talking about different regional aspects. Um, at the very beginning, we thought that we can literally focus on the being memorial place, but we found out that that's not enough because there's no culture of talking through traumatic experience and events. So we positioned ourselves as a safe space for creating this dialogue, proper terms, finding the language, creating this particular discourse about traumatic experiences in past and modern life and aiming to develop 
uh, tolerant and inclusive community and then uh, uh, first of researchers and then to transfer it to the wider society. That's quite a challenging task, obviously, especially in times of ongoing war when <laughs> uh, the word tolerance can literally hurt those who were hurt by, let's say, missiles attack last night, right? So this is very delicate sphere and I would like to ask you to recognize and consider this, that talking about ongoing and historical events has quite important difference in it. So we have quite diverse uh, focuses and main activities, uh, exhibitions, educational projects, artistic interventions into the urban space and different experiments. Uh, so I really like the Sebastian uh, presentation about what they done and I think those are very important projects which can uh, bring us a wider audience. And uh, we are documenting traumatic events right now through oral history as a main methodology and with a focus since the 1930s until current times. The first uh, and the main uh, project I would love to introduce to you, this is a lost childhood. There was research that we gathered the witnesses, testimonies, over 30 of the people who were kids during their deportation to Siberia and Kazakhstan back in between late 30s and early 50s. Um, that was very challenging project just to find those willing to talk. So at the end of the day, we got uh, those like 30 stories we were allowed to public because some people in the middle of the sharing their stories and narratives, they were holding back. They didn't feel even back in the middle of you know, 2020s, not safe enough to share their stories. Some told us, you can share after I die. So we collected the series of narrative interviews, biographical interviews, old pictures, video recordings of those testimonies, and our recordings of testimonies. Uh, how we were building language. We found out that within historical schools, that was quite challenging to find the proper language. So we built a very diverse team built with a containing historians, cultural studies, uh, photo and videographers, visual experiments, they all were part of the team. And obviously the international group of curators, we had curator from Ukraine and from Czech, and also we, uh, one more uh, joined the team later from Crimea. Our methodology, the core obviously the oral history, but we really included culture studies, anthropology, sociology, political studies, museum studies, gender studies. That was very difficult because we were asked a lot of times, why are you mostly interviewing women? Just because they live longer. <laughs> Just because then they were more willing to share as well. So for us, that was additional challenge to find older men who were willing to tell their story and then to share it publicly. That was part of the... And then psychology, obviously, history on, and different, different parts of Soviet and uh, history of Western Ukraine. When we were trying to find out how we are going to introduce it publicly, we done some research on children in war history told in museums. And we found out that none of those big and recognized brands we work with quite closely fit what we are looking for. They don't work with their stories. They don't work with the reality of the history of Ukraine back in 1930s or 40s. And we uh, set up the um, workshop and consider that what we are trying to avoid, first of all, the artificiality of the approach and the modernization of anyhow, banality, pop representation. I believe that my mood board at the end was containing 70 pages, <laughs> each page that was about like maybe probably five, six pictures, and 55 pages that was what we trying to avoid, what we are mostly scared to go for. What do we want to build a narrative on? So we decided that that definitely a real and a historic, true historical content, subjects of all photographs, real stories, and artifacts 
of memories, which can be also quite challenging how we learned it later on. That was a historical and cultural context. A very limited number of our participants had any pictures or had any artifacts they brought back from Siberia or Kazakhstan. So even, I remember we have one pencil, which was the very first exponent, and this exhibit was so precious for us that we built the whole room around it, but that was only start. When we managed to build the trust among the community, people started to bring us more and more, not only stories, but exhibits as well. And then we realized that the topic itself is very challenging. So we put together a series of historical lectures, everything, history of Gulag, Holocaust, Holodomor, Crimean Tatar context, general context, and that was mandatory for all the team, including designers, <laughs> to listen to all the lectures. So this is how we created the shared, very strong and solid context where we could move forward. We created based on the interviews. Each interview is, as you know, narrative interviews are literally like three hours, three and a half. No one going to listen to the whole thing. So we created a tag cloud and based on the different motives that we're sharing. And then we started to think how we can deliver it to the wider public for them to be interested to listen to it. Then how to create the narrative of the lost childhood. We tried to visualize that map of displacement and the typical patterns of growing up. But it appeared that all these kids, they had very diverse and different stories in their background. Some were, that was one of my favorite, um, that he, uh, uh, the older man, he said, like, when the war started, I was playing hide and seek and hiding in a cherry tree. It hit me really hard because uh, literally a few months ago, I was interviewing a kid from her son, and he said the very same. We never realized that those patterns could be so similar within the next hundred years. Some had a piano lessons or French language lessons. So they were from the very different families. And their stories were very, very diverse. But then their stories became one when they appear and then they find themselves in this transition train. Then all their stories became black and white. The very same topics, the very same issues, the death of another kids, the hygiene issues, food issues, lost parents, and then it changed. So when we were creating a website, that was in their imagination a map of deportation. This is how it looked on our website as well. You have a map of Ukraine with uh, different colors. When you click on the dots, you can uh, learn their stories. You have the train where you have the very same quotes about the very same events with some videos, I'll show you some. And then you have, initially we were trying to picture Siberia, but then we realized that this is just something. For them it was here and there. Even if they were lucky enough to get into the territories, they were not really fought by local people as an um, enemy of the states, they still consider it as a home of others, not our home. Even if they manage to build some, I don't know, semi-friendly relationship with the locals. Uh, I just wanted to show you a few little... Can you please help me? I don't know how to put that, uh, the video to play. Can I ask the technical support, please? Yeah. Here, if we can share the video. No, дорога була дуже далека, дуже було тяжко, тому що жара, літо, і віконечко одне, і ми діти практично всі, хто нас там був, всі в те віконечко висовувались. До Уралу, після Уралу 
ну, зупинки були довгі, ми стояли, могли і дубами, напевно, стояти, бо тож графіку не було. І ще один такий момент, який мені добре запам'ятався, коли вже були за Оралом, коли ми в'їжджали в Оральський, до Орала під'їжджали в гори, там тунелі були, ми ж того не знали. І тут діти, ми почали бачити, що у нас перші ті вагони в'їжджають в п'єць. Ми робили крик, у нас палити везуть. Плач і молитва, більше нічого не було. То я пам'ятаю ті крики. And the next slide with the video, please, as well. This is, yeah, this one, yeah. No, I put the road here, we're out, the post of the kid out is is who won you. No, and Narash and Narot Ukrainians that he should love to play. No, to play, or to to play, or to do good. So I just stay with the pogone, score the stop, the turn the pogone, so I'll just do my best. Prepare to play. Singing as a coping mechanism, right? It always works for us. Thank you. And so, maybe, yeah. Uh, so this project, we're still working on that, but obviously the main challenge is as only we have found the people who are ready to give the testimonies, we're sending the expedition right away because they are all 80 plus. So we want to collect all those original testimonies as soon as possible. So we created the website and also a series of street exhibitions uh, with the representing events. So you can see the one of the uh, stands. So we are giving some bit of the general context for creating the general understanding of the events. We're given a bit of the quote, which is the key of this particular story, and then the bio of the person we were uh, we were interviewing, and um, welcome to visit our website and also share the story or recommend anyone who can be interested in sharing their stories. So this is one of the the I introduced the, the journey how we were building the language, and even though being very delicate and accurate in terms of building the narratives, now we got challenged by the kids living out the very same stories right now. And the issue of re-traumatizing became very real. And I really hope that our experience will never, ever be useful for you, just as a learning case. And just to give you a glance, this is about the kid. This uh, project was built together by a kid who never, ever knew what the Soviet terror is. Katarina Lisevenko, she is a very talented young artist, and we have, as a part of our collection, those Soviet monuments. So she put together, since 2017, we are forming the collection on Soviet mon monumental art. Instead of destroying, we're bringing and, let's say, de-heroizing them. <laughs> yeah, de-demonization process. And so she put together, I was creating her project of the how to use those monuments to create a park, <laughs> recreation park, how to release all that terror context. That was quite a controversial project, especially for older people. Some were very, very annoyed by the idea, but then we got ourselves a big fan club from the young teenagers uh, recording TikToks. <laughs> And then it, it brought us quite a wider audience which never heard about the deportation history, for example. And the bonded culture, not stop on it because we, uh, have, we are running out of time, but this is what is very important about that, that this is a very different methodology with oral history. We are recording uh, as a, using VR technology, destroyed museums, and also gathering the testimonies of the people who were there during the occupation period, why they would stay, why they would, even without any state support, hide their exhibits, risking their lives, risking their careers as well. And um, those are our insights. I know I have no time to put it all nicely together, but then possibly I will just only focus at the last one 
about remembering about red traumatization risks, including your own team. Because when we all work on very difficult topics, we found out that that was totally unprojected outcomes. And after one of the exhibition to the East and South, which ended up with us not being able to release our recordings publicly because of the security measures, we got half of our team almost hospitalized, because, not only because of the events of the war, but also because of the traumatic experience they gained during these expeditions. So I'm really grateful for giving me uh, space here today. Sorry if I uh, overbooked a bit on the time, but um, I think that we are now in a very, very unique moment when we are building something what can be a very grounded foundation for education on a future peace, because you only can avoid war remembering what wars bring, war bring to our lives. Thank you.